Good morning and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Rusk Sunday morning Bible study. We are moving uh, through the New Testament book of Acts and we'll be dealing with verses from, uh, actually it's going to be chapter, um, should I have that ready for you? Chapter 12 today. And uh, so I encourage you to get a Bible or some type of device with scripture so that you can look at Acts chapter 12. I'm going to lead a prayer and then we'll look at our verses for today. <clears throat> Father, thank you again for the privilege of, of reading and your word and, and letting you, asking you to uh, speak to us through your word. We know that uh, you have used uh, people uh, of, of old who you've inspired to record um, your impressions upon them, and uh, we have it now in Scripture, and that's a privilege we have. So help us as we look at these verses today from chapter 12 of the book of Acts, and help us to glean uh, not only the view the historical facts that are uh, related therein, but also seek to to uh, apply uh, lessons that we can learn for our daily lives. I pray you'll help me help each one who hears this Bible study that that purpose might be accomplished. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, last week in our study, we were dealing, I believe, in chapter 10 uh, of Acts, where a, a, a Gentile, a non-Jewish uh, person named Cornelius, who was a, uh, a military man in charge of a hundred uh, soldiers of the Roman uh, army, and uh, he was a godly uh, man. He, he feared God. He... Uh, he worshiped to God, he prayed, and he he gave generously to people in need. Uh, and uh, but he, he had not been uh, exposed to the gospel, uh, the news about Jesus Christ uh, being the Son of God sent from God to live on this earth for a brief time, and then. Uh, to teach, to live a sinless life, to teach the the uh, the laws of God, the, the teachings of God, the instructions of God, and then to allow himself to be crucified on a cross, uh, and that by his death he made a sacrifice for my sins, for your sins, for the sins of all who would come after it, him uh, who would place their faith, trust, and reliance upon Jesus and his death and resurrection. Cornelius had not uh, been, uh, that the gospel had not come to his attention, and God brought it to his attention through Peter, uh, whom God, uh, an angel of God, gave a vision about uh, a sheet like. Uh, object coming down from heaven with all kinds of animals, unclean un animals that uh, the Jewish people were commanded by the Old Testament laws not to eat. And uh, the voice of the angel or of God told him to eat. And he said no, but he said these are unclean. And God said hey, if I tell you to eat, it's clean, it's good. So he did. And by that by that vision, and then as he goes to, uh, he told him to go into Caesarea, where um, where uh, Cornelius was, and uh, Cornelius would be waiting for him in his whole household, and then he could present the gospel to them, which he did, and they responded, uh, they they believed, they accepted the work of God was working in the life of Cornelius and his whole household 
that heard the gospel through Peter, uh, and they were converted. They they were born again. We, as John, the Gospel of John, chapter three, talks talks about Jesus telling Nicodemus that had to be born again. That conversion, that regeneration, that new birth happened to Cornelius and his household as they heard, and the Holy Spirit fell on them, came into their lives, fell on them, uh, and uh, as as the Holy Spirit does with anyone who is converted, who is saved, who is born again, who is regenerated, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, Scripture teaches us, and that's what happened there. Okay, I want to move from that, that's background to uh, chapter 11, uh, which uh, relates to uh, Peter, uh, after that experience with Cornelius in Caesarea, he went back uh, to uh, Jerusalem, which is sort of the headquarters of the apostles. Uh, of course, that's where, outside the city where Jesus had been crucified, and uh, and also that experienced the uh, the extraordinary supernatural coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So that was their their home base for the believers of Christ in Christ. He went there, and they had already heard about uh, how he had gone to uh, Caesarea and uh, had uh, had gone to the house of of, uh, of Cornelius, a Gentile, which was not uh, to be done by the the Jews uh, there, so that was contrary to their teachings. And uh, he had to explain himself, and he explained the whole thing about the vision that he had had from God about the animals and how he went to to Caesarea and encountered Cornelius, who had also had a vision to go send for Peter in Joppa, and uh, how they had, as he shared the gospel, as Peter shared the gospel, how they, they, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were saved, they were converted, uh, and uh, they, they manifested their conversion by the speaking in tongues or some type of ecstatic utterances, which was very similar to the experience of, of the Jews uh, in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost which was, and they knew that the Holy Spirit of God had come upon them. So, he explains that to them in Jerusalem, to the, to the uh, church leaders there, and they, they responded in, in, uh, in thanksgiving. And they were glad that, uh, that God had extended the gospel message to Gentile. It says in verse 18 of, of Acts 11, chapter 11, that when when the, the Christians there in Jerusalem heard Peter's report, it says they glorified God, saying God has also granted to Gentiles repentance to life, eternal life. Okay, after that, uh, after that in, in chapter 11, it talks about the persecution of Christians that arose, arose following the time of Stephen's uh, death, Stephen's murder by the Jewish religious leaders uh, because he had preached the gospel of Jesus to them. And so the great movement of persecution and Christians scattered from Jerusalem into various places. And some of them went up and northward into what is modern day Syria uh, to the city of Antioch and the gospel was spreading there. People were coming to faith in Jesus. So uh, when, when that became known to the Christians in Jerusalem, they sent Barnabas up there. Barnabas was one of the Christians, leaders there in Jerusalem. Uh, following the death and resurrection and ascension back to heaven of Jesus. And they sent him to Antioch to check things out, and he was pleased, and uh, uh, he uh, uh, he stayed with them a while, and then he 
he left because he knew that Saul, uh, the later to be named Paul, had been there, uh, and uh, but he had left to go back to his hometown of Tarsus. So Barnabas decides, I'm going to go to Tarsus and find Saul. And he does. But now that brings us to chapter 12, which uh, uh, the scene changes there. And it begins by saying that Herod, the king, this was, uh, this was the third uh, Herod. The first one had been uh, king uh, of that area uh, when uh, Jesus was born. And he tried to kill Jesus by having all the, the Jewish children of uh, uh, less than a, like a year or two old killed. Uh, that was the first one. And then uh, the second uh, 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 Herod also was uh, against the gospel. And uh, Jesus had, had they taken Jesus to her to him when Jesus was arrested by the by the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. Okay, this is the third one. This is the grandson, and he he says that he he persecuted the church of Christ, and he killed James, the half brother of Jesus. Uh, uh, no, this is James, the brother of John. Apostle John, James and John, uh, sons of Zebedee, I'm sorry. Uh, he was one of the leaders there in the church and uh, in Jerusalem, the Christians. He had him killed and he had Peter, once he got back to Jerusalem, arrested and put into jail. But when the Christians there in Jerusalem uh, realized what had happened to Peter, they began to pray fervently for him. Uh, it says in in verse 5, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church, by the Christians, uh, the followers of Jesus there in Jerusalem. All right, let's pick up now with our focal verses, which began at uh, verse 6. When Herod was about to bring Peter out for trial, the very night before that, uh, Peter was in prison. He was bound in chains. Was had two Roman uh, uh, guards watching him. And uh, suddenly it says, verse seven, an angel of the Lord appeared uh, there in Peter's presence, uh, and a light, a great light from God, shone into the prison uh, cell. And uh, the angel of God appeared and touched Peter and said, "Get up, quick!" And get dressed because uh, you are going to be released from this prison. And when he began to stand up, his chains just fell off him, supernaturally fell off him. And he, he went, he got on his robe and his sandals, and his cloak rather than his sandals. And the angel said, follow me. And he led him out of the prison, right through two sets of guards. Uh, and they came to a gate that leads into the to the area where he was, and the gates just opened supernaturally by themselves, and they went out into the street. So this miraculous uh, uh, freeing, supernatural uh, intervention on God's part to release Peter from prison to this angel and uh, get him out of there. And that's what's recorded here. And this is, uh, importantly, uh, the response of God to the fervent prayers of the Christians there on Peter's behalf, praying for Peter in prison, and God answered their prayers. So we need to be reminded again that God knows what's going on in our lives. He knows the things that uh, are pleasant, the things that are unpleasant, the things that we consider good, the things that we consider bad. And he's aware, and he will intervene, particularly when we are praying for his will to be done. 
and that's what the Christians were doing there, and God responded. So verse 11 says, when Peter came to himself, he, he was sort of in a fog as all this was happening with the angel in the prison cell and the chains falling off and uh, him moving out uh, to pass the prison guards without any problem. And Peter said to himself, I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all the Jewish people that were expecting me to be killed. As soon as he realizes, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, uh, and John the Apostle, uh, no, not John the Apostle, but John who was also called Mark. This is, uh, I'm getting my Johns mixed up, but this is John Mark. Uh, his mother was named Mary, and that's where a lot of the Christians were staying. They were praying there for Peter. And as Peter got to the door, he knocked at the door of the outer gate, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. But when she got near the, the gate, she recognized Peter's voice and got so excited that instead of opening the gate and letting Peter in, she ran back inside where the others were gathered to tell them that Peter was outside at the gate. Uh, and they responded to her in verse 15, you're out of your mind. Uh, because they knew he was in prison. They knew he had been in prison for a while. And, uh, but she kept insisting that it was true. And they said it, it must be his angel. But Peter, he's still out there at the outer gate, knocking on the gate where Rhoda left him. Uh, she didn't actually, I don't know that she actually even saw him, but she heard his voice and turned back inside the house. And uh, so Peter's still knocking. And so they finally opened the door uh, at the gate, the gate door, and had him come in. And he comes in to the others that were gathered there at the house. And he, he, he asked them to be silent. And he began to tell them uh, about how God, through that angel, had enabled him to be released from prison. And uh, uh, so uh, he, uh, Peter said, tell these things to James and the brothers. All right, now, we've already read in, uh, in uh, the beginning of verse chapter 12 that Herod had killed James, the brother of John. So I'm not sure how we reconcile the timing on this, but uh, that's Peter's message to them there at, at uh, the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, uh, to go tell the, the other uh, Christians, the apostles there, what had happened. Now, so that's the, that's the, uh, that's the scriptures that are uh, our lesson for today uh, from the 12th chapter of the book of Acts. Now, what are we to glean from these verses? Well, uh, we can see several things. One is that, uh, that when the gospel prospers, when people are responding to God, to the message of Jesus Christ, uh, uh, that persecution will arise because Satan and the forces of evil uh, get very resistive when, when God is being magnified through the preaching of the gospel. So that's what happened after the disbursement of the Christians uh, from Jerusalem out into the outlying areas, Antioch and other surrounding places, Persecution arose, uh, but but the church continued to thrive. Now, that's a very important thing that I think has application for us today, and that is that the, the gospel message, the kingdom of God, thrives 
it grows. It is exalted. God is exalted when Christians are persecuted. Now that seems almost um, contradictory. It would seem uh, paradoxical. Is what I'm trying to say. It would seem that when Christians are being persecuted, uh, the gospel would would, would uh, not grow. But it's just the opposite, because the power of God is manifested, is made obvious when when He works among people to protect and preserve and to uh, rescue his followers, his disciples. And so uh, when persecution occurs, the gospel grows even more. Now, what applications that I have to us today? I think it is that the church as a whole, church Christian churches as a whole, Today, throughout the world, there are places in the world where they are growing, but here in the United States and in many other places, Europe and otherwise, they're not growing. And, and it's, I suspect, it's because there's not being experienced persecution. Why aren't they being, why are we experiencing persecution? Because we're not being bold enough. We're not being outspoken enough. We're not being courageous enough in our testimony and our witness for Jesus and our our proclamation of the kingdom of God. Because when we do, when we forcefully and boldly uh, and actively proclaim the kingdom of God and the gospel message of Jesus Christ, persecution will arise. It's just going to follow. It always has. And, uh, and, uh, so we should examine ourselves and wonder. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a, of a verse that comes to my mind from Second Timothy. Uh, uh, where it says that uh, it, all who live, yes, verse 2. 12 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ will suffer persecution. It's there. Uh, so if we're not experiencing some type of persecution, at least from time to time, we need to ask ourselves, are we living the kind of godly life, the kind of bold, courageous witnessing life for God that he desires because that will bring persecution. But when persecution comes, the gospel of Jesus spreads even more and people, the, the Christians grow. They grow in faith. The number of Christians grow, people are converted. And so that would be my take from this lesson. One of the one of the uh, lessons from this Bible study is that we need to examine ourselves and, and whether we are being persecuted, well, why not? Whether we're being active and bold enough uh, in, in our witness for Jesus Christ. We need to also learn from this lesson that when persecution comes or when any difficulty comes, uh, we are to pray about it. We're to go to God in fervent, fervent prayer as the, the Christians there in Jerusalem did in behalf of Peter who was in prison. And God hears prayer. He, he is not, it is not like having a genie in a, in a, a, a gold uh, bowl that we can rub and call upon and he will come and say, what, I'm here to grant you every wish. No, that's not the way prayer works. It's not the way God works. But God hears our prayers. And in his timing and in his will and in his plan, he answers to accomplish not our desires always, but his purposes. And so we should avail ourselves of prayer, knowing that God knows what needs to happen next to advance his kingdom and accomplish his purposes. 
You and I, as believers, uh, are a part of God's kingdom, and God wants to use us in in different ways, uh, and He will He will do that if we will be committed and faithful and yielded to Him, uh, staying as close as we can in prayer, Bible study, fellowship with Christians, and godly living. And I think that's the message. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this scriptures that we looked at today from, from Acts chapter 12. And I pray that you'll continue to speak to us as we continue uh, next week. We'll be beginning a new calendar quarter, but we're still going to be in the study of, of Acts. About your, your using the early Christians there after the, the death, resurrection, ascension, of Jesus as they grew, as they experienced persecution, as they dealt with it, as you blessed them. And we ask you to use us, God, use us and help us to not fear persecution, but to wonder why we're not experiencing it when we don't, because we're maybe not being aggressive enough, faithful enough, bold enough, Courageous enough in our witness for you. God, help us to be bold. Help us to be faithful. And help us to rely upon you in constant prayer for your using us however you might want to use us in this life, in the remaining years of on this earth. And I pray this. In 